Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is a regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, There's Something Wrong. Have you ever had that annoying feeling like something is wrong? Like something is about to happen that, that, that isn't right? You feel like something bad, something dreadfully bad is, is, is just about to happen. But you don't know what it is and you don't know why you have this feeling. It's, it often happens like sometimes like when you're leaving home for vacation or going for a long trip out of town and you get that nagging feeling that, that you left the door unlocked. You, um, even when, when you're leaving your office, you feel like maybe you left that office door unlocked. Sometimes you have to turn around and go back and check the door and the door is actually locked. <laughs> But you, you had that feeling like something's wrong. Sometimes you're lying in bed and you think, Ooh, did I lock the back door? And you got to get up out of your nice warm bed and go downstairs and you get downstairs and the door's locked. But that's called a sixth sense. And we, we've been endowed with that. It's given to us by our Heavenly Father, God Most High. And it helps us to keep from making terrible mistakes. It helps us to keep on track. It, it, it warns us uh, of, of things that could happen. It's almost kind of like premonition, but it's not. It, it's that sense that God has instilled in us. Well, something is wrong in our society, and worse, Something is wrong in the church, and very few are noticing it. As a society, we're making mistakes one right after the next, after the next, one right after another, and nobody it seems to be trying to correct these mistakes. Political correctness is, is the something is wrong meter. And atheism and secularism are the law of the day. The news does not talk about these things. They, they keep it under wraps and they distract the citizens of the world from the real scourge of the earth, atheism. Because Psalms 32 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen and his heritage. And that, my friends, that is what I would like to talk about today in my message. There's something wrong. So please turn with me to a scripture which is found in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There's a way that seems right to a man. The scripture tells us this path is a familiar path. It's well trotted. It's the road that, that, that everyone is traveling on. The highway is bustling. The traffic is all going in one way. There's no traffic jams. Everybody is in one accord. They're going this way, one way. No one is concerned. This, my friend, is the wrong Way because the scripture tells us that that way is the way of death. It seems like the right way, but it's not the right way. Narrow is the path, narrow is the gate, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many, many will travel on that, but just a few will find that narrow path that leads to life. I want to ask you this question. And I want to ask you in, in, in two ways. Two, two, two ways. This is the question. If you were dying of a terrible, non-curable disease, but someone knew about a pharmacist who actually had a cure for this disease, but it was very, very politically offensive, and that pharma pharmacist himself was hated because of his politically offensive cure, would you want someone to tell you about him anyway? Even though it's very politically incorrect, it's offensive even to mention his name. Would you want 
someone to tell you about, about the cure? Or would you rather them not tell you, not offend you, and let you die from the disease instead? Or let's put it this way. What if you lived in a world where everyone made their own decisions, they made their own mistakes, and it was politically incorrect to make suggestions or correct somebody else's thinking. Would you want someone to warn you, despite the risk of offending you, and save your life? Or would you want to go ahead and do whatever it was you were planning on doing, and keep happy, happy temporarily, but die prematurely? You think about that, because it seems far-fetched, but that is where our society is today. The pressure of political correctness and the societal hate for God has stripped most Christians of their boldness and their confidence and their willingness to witness to others and save souls. They, they, they are, are not confident anymore. They, they're not willing to put themselves out there to, to, um, to win souls. Because it's politically incorrect and it's offensive to people to witness to them, to tell them that there is an eternity, that they, there is a God and they will have to stand before a righteous God and give an account. And if they do not have Jesus as their advocate, they will spend eternity in a lake of fire. That is reality. Society wants to be left alone. They want to have their own way, a way that seems right to them. And they, they, neither, they either don't believe or they don't even care that it leads to death. And that's a sad situation to be in. Something is wrong with that picture. But the sad part is, is that it's not just happening in the secular world. Or it's not just happening with unbelievers. It is happening right here in the church as well. Those who call themselves Christians, they are not doing what it is that Jesus has called them to do. And that they're living such a, a lukewarm life that they don't even, people don't even know that they're Christians to begin with. Something is wrong when a Christian can go for days or even weeks without any type of prayer, without any type of worship, without any type of communion with their God. And they feel nothing about it. Admittedly, a few weeks ago, we had our granddaughter visiting us. And we, have a, we had a really great time with her. We, we, we were really busy doing vacation stuff. Needless to say, I did not have my regular time in prayer. After a few days, I felt like something was terribly wrong. I felt the, the, the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, like something dreadful was about to happen. That, that, that sinking feeling. It woke me up at 3.30 in the morning. And I had to get out of bed 3.30 in the morning and make my way over to my prayer couch and kneel down and spend some time in prayer. It was only after I spent a while in prayer, seeking God, calling upon his name, that the feeling began to subside. We should be convicted if we do not spend time with our God. It's no way that a Christian can, can not feel convicted within themselves if they do not spend time with their God in prayer. They do not spend time in worship. They do not spend time praising his name. There's something wrong. There's something wrong when Christians can vote for killing innocent babies. Something is wrong when Christians can fight for rights that are an abomination to God because it is the right of their affiliated, of their affiliated party, their affiliated political party. We choose to side with God and offend, or we choose to side with man and offend God because of politics, because of race, because of ethnicity, or anything else. We'd rather side with man instead of God. 
You know, something is wrong when Christians, Christians can sit through an hour and a half of the nastiest, dirtiest movies without even flinching, without having the slightest bit of uneasiness, without even having the slightest bit of conviction. They can sit through movies and TV shows that use the name of their God as a cuss word. They feel no way about it. Something is wrong. I saw an interview where some guy, I, I can't remember his name right now, but a, a guy, he, he went around um, and he was interviewing random people who identified as born-again believers. And, and the question was, did, did, did they change the kinds of movies that they used to watch? Every one of them indicated that they had no problems with watching movies with sex scenes. They had no problem with movies, watching movies that dropped the F-bomb with cussing in it. Using the name of the Lord, their God, as a cuss word, they had no problem with nothing, with none of it. They indicated that they had no problem and they would not be changing what they watched because they liked the action movies. Pure Desire Ministries did a five-year study on evangelical men and pastors who watch porn. I know, I know that, that, that sounds like an oxymoron. But nonetheless, according to their studies, 68% of evangelical men watch porn on a regular basis. This is not clicking on it accidentally and watching a few seconds, even, even a minute or two of it, and then clicking off of it. This is actually watching porn on a regular basis. 68% of evangelical men watch porn on a regular basis. Something is wrong. Then the study went on to say that they found that 50% of evangelical pastors watch porn on a regular basis. One out of two pastors, evangelical pastors, watch porn on a regular basis. You know, a friend of mine told me a story about a man just, just last week. He told me a story about a man who came into his office for a loan. The man said that he was a minister of the gospel and he was about to graduate from seminary. Then, uh, as the conversation went on, the, the man emphasized that what it was that he was saying. He said, I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm about to get my license. So by and by, my friend asked him if he wanted him to set him up for, for the portal and set it up on his phone. Then he asked the man to hand him over his phone so he could give him a hand setting it up. The minister of the gospel said, be careful with that. You don't know what you might see. I'm a minister of the gospel, yes, but I watch a little porn. What can I say? I like big butts with the sex toy. This man is supposed to be a minister of the gospel, but I guess that backs up the statistic that says, 50% of the pastors watch porn on a regular basis. That is sad. Something is wrong. You know, something is wrong when such anger grabs hold of our praise and worship leaders and our praise and worshipers who, who uh, and some of the filthiest and nastiest, dirty words come flying out of their mouths because they're angry, because they're upset. And it comes just rolling off the tips of their tongues like butter rolling off of a hot knife. Those kinds of words don't just accidentally slip out. Not one right after a next, right after another, right after another. It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And there is no excuse for it. There's none. No excuse. What you have stored up in your heart is what will come out in an unguarded moment. So if you have filth stored up, 
filth will come out. But if you have goodness and righteousness stored up, goodness and righteousness will come out. See, you don't draw fresh water and brackish water from the same well. When computers first came out, they had an, an acronym called GIGO. G-I-G-O. It stood for garbage in, garbage out. So, if you talk like, like that, if you use those kind of words on a regular basis, if you watch movies with, with those kind of words on a regular basis, if you listen to programs and songs with those kind of nasty words on a regular basis, guess what? Garbage in, garbage out. out. And so, if you talk like that, if you have that stored up, in your, in your heart, because you're watching it all the time, because you're listening to it all the time, because people around you are just using it all the time, and it doesn't convict you, then in, in, in your moment of anger, in your moment of being upset, it'll come flowing out, and something is wrong. I believe it goes back, like I said, it goes back to that movie thing, that Christians can just sit and watch that kind of filth and listen to that kind of filth and store it up in their hearts. Because when it goes in, it's, it's being stored somewhere. That's why a lot of Christians do not have a problem sitting through a full length movie with the actors dropping that left, the, 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 the F bomb left, right, and center. Because they use the F bomb themselves. Denzel Washington is a devoted, born-again Christian and a great actor. But as Christians, my, my family and I, we, we can't watch any of his movies. And I even believe that he said that he don't let his children watch his movies either. So, that in itself says something. But what a shame. He seems to have a great marriage. He seems to be a, 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 a great example for marriage, considering he's part of Hollywood. But as for me, me and my house, we don't watch anything that we can't watch as a family. If I can't watch it with my children, if I can't watch it with my grandchildren, I don't watch it by myself. I don't play it in my house. That's why we got rid of our cable TV. That's why we don't have a satellite dish. Garbage in, garbage out. There's nothing on TV that's worth watching. There's nothing on TV that a Christian can watch. You know something is wrong when Christians can hate, backbite, lie, steal, and cheat, and it does not bother them at all. My wife, she had a client who was a born-again Christian, a man who was a pillar in his church, but she could not take his word for anything. Nothing he said could she just take his word for. For it. Anytime she had dealings with this client, this Christian man, she had to always get it in writing. That's sad. That's very sad. That's shameful. The church has become so weak that we have lost our witness to the world. We no longer seek holiness, we no longer seek righteousness. I once had a Christian man tell me that not to worry about that stuff because no one can live up to that kind of high standard of, of a lifestyle. So don't worry about it. But there's an excuse to do what he wanted to do. You know, there's something dreadfully wrong when Christians can live riotous lives and feel no remorse. They feel no conviction. They feel no guilt. We, had, we attended a big church um, several years back. They had two morning services. 
We became friends with one of the women in the church. We came to find out that her, her daughter sang on, on, on the choir, and we were impressed. And, but we were really surprised when we found out or when we learned that this, this young woman lived with her boyfriend, unmarried. But someone said, oh, but Brother Kenny, that's no big deal anymore. Everybody is doing it. Everybody's doing it now. No. No. For us, some things never change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So again, for us, some things never change. There are Christian women who get caught up in the trap of believing that having sex outside marriage is no big deal. It's the only way, way for them to net the right man. Besides, they do Bible studies together. So, so they, they, they can do Bible studies, and after Bible study, they can go and have, check, and have sex. But that changes nothing. It changes absolutely nothing. You can do all kinds of in-depth Bible study. You can do all kinds of prayer groups. But when you go and start having sex outside marriage, you have crossed the lines. That is not okay. Sex creates a spiritual tie called soul ties. Paul said that the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Therefore, we ought to keep our bodies a living sacrifice. Look at what he told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Nor do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It says the two become one during sex. Even if it's only a one night stand, his or her generational curses will be transferred. These general, generational curses transfer from one partner to the next partner to the next partner. Apparently, fear, anxiety, even panic attacks can be transferred during a sexual encounter. After a sexual encounter, the, 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 the partner can be plagued with spiritual warfare. That is one of the reasons why every other sin is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Sexual sin and idolatry are the only two sins we are told to flee. All the other sins, the, all the other temptations, the scripture tells us to stand up under it because we were not given more than we can bear. And even when we're tempted, God provides a way for us out. But the sin of sexual immor immorality, we are to flee. We're to run away. We're to be like Joseph who, who, who took off his coat and he ran outside. He fled sexual immorality. Sex, in essence, is a spiritual experience. It involves the body. It involves the mind. It involves the soul. As we alluded to earlier, it's body, soul, and mind. So when Christians can have sex as a recreational event, something is wrong. God demanded that we be pure. God demanded that we pursue holiness. He wants us to be holy just as he is holy. We must pursue holiness. Someone will say, 
Oh, Brother Kenny, are you against sex? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not against sex. I believe God gave us sex as a marital gift. Remember when you were planning your, your, your wedding, you and your, your spouse registered at stores and your family members, your friends, your loved ones, those who, who you invited to your wedding to share that day with you. They went out and they bought the stuff that was on your registry and they gave it to you as a marital gift. It's the same thing. God gave us married couples a marital gift and it's sex. Thank him for it if you're married. You know, something is wrong when the church is mimicking the world instead of mimicking Jesus. The world, ha or, or, or the world has a death grip on the church. You can't even tell a Christian from an atheist. And you can't tell an atheist from a Christian. They look alike. They talk alike. They act alike. Christians are more tatted up than the secular. Why? Why is that necessary? More and more denominations are splitting up over sexual perversion. Things that have been settled for more than 2,000 years are now being brought back into question. Everything these days seems to be backward. Society is put in bitter for sweet, evil for good, darkness for light. They're fleeing holiness and instead they're, 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 they're embracing immorality. They should be in, uh, fleeing immorality and embracing holiness, but they're fleeing holiness. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God's woe to those who do these things is a huge thing. It's a huge warning. It's never, ever a good thing when God says, woe to you. Look at what is destined for those who do such things. I want you to drop on down to verse 24 and verse 25. Same chapter, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24 and 25. It says, Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble, and as dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will be as rottenness. Their blossom goes up like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them and the mountains quaked. Their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger has not turned away. And his hand is still stretched out still. God takes that kind of stuff seriously. You may not actually be doing these things yourself. But if you vote for or if you support, support those who do, God is speaking to you as well. And he's saying there is definitely something wrong. It is not your choice. You are bought with a price. You may feel like it's your choice, and I guess in a way it is your choice, but it is not your freedom to do such things. There is a God that you will have to give an answer to, and he will say, sorry, wrong choice. The world, the secular world, may throw preachers of holiness into prison. They may strip them of their earthly honor. They may make fun of them and say all manner of evil against them and persecute them. But there is still a God that they will have to stand before and they will have to give an account to him. So in closing, I want to ask you, 
or I want to encourage you as Christians. Let us set the right example. Let us seek holiness. Let us seek righteousness. Let us be the salt of the earth. Let us be the light of the world. Let me ask you this. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know Jesus as the true light? If you do not, he's made it real easy for us. All we have to do is to ask him. So if you would like to ask Jesus, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to spend eternity in blissfulness with Jesus, all you got to do is to ask him. He's invited everyone. He said, whomsoever will, come. If you want to come, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Wash me in your blood. Help me to live for you. Help me to have boldness and confidence. Help me to resist temptation. Help me to flee sexual immorality. Help me to cling to that which is good and forsake that which is evil. That I might be, live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what I suggest you do. Buy yourself a Bible and you read that Bible every single day. And it doesn't matter where you start, whether you start in the Old Testament or the New Testament, whether you start in Genesis or in Matthew. It doesn't matter. Just start. Read it every single day. And try to read it through in one year. Read the whole Bible through. Buy yourself a highlighter. And as you read, highlight the promises. Those verses that stand out to you. And stand on those promises. God will honor his promises. You just pray, believe, believe for those promises. And you will see that God will honor those Here's the next thing that I suggest that you do. Find yourself a Bible believe in church that still believes in holiness, that still believes in righteousness. Not one of those progressive churches that anything goes, but find yourself a real Bible believe in church that still believes that thus saith the Lord. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when the Lord comes back, and I believe that he's coming back real soon, he'll find you doing what it is that he wants you to do, that he's called you to do. And if he finds you doing what it is that he's called you to do, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. No more heartaches, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sun beating down on you, working hard. It will be blissfulness, joy unspeakable. So if you pray that prayer, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord help you to live for him. And I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you joining us every week. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.